Hello, it's Mark Pereira here and welcome to the uh, virtual book launch for Procurement with Purpose. Uh, with me I have Peter Smith and uh, let's get him on stage with me. Hey Peter, can oh. you hear me okay? There I am, yes I can hear you, can you hear me? <laughs> Indeed, we're live on LinkedIn so uh, hopefully uh, and on YouTube so hopefully we'll get a few questions in from the audience as we go through the session today. But firstly I wanted to thank you for, uh, well, wine and uh, a bit of tea over here so congratulations on uh, on the getting the book out it's been great working with you and fantastic to get people uh, reading it as well it's a little bit Excellent. thicker than hmm? <laughs> a little bit thicker than i thought it would be yeah i i mean to be fair the uh, the way the publisher laid it out which i quite like uh there are fewer words per page than than you get in some books uh, which is quite good for us old folks who, you know, don't like the very small print. So I, I was thinking it would be under 300 pages and it's actually nearer 400. But don't be intimidated. It is, you can read each page quite quickly, basically. So nice, nice, nice big typeface there, as as you can see. Indeed. Uh, well, Peter, so, we should yeah. do, I should ask you what, what uh, maybe give the backstory of uh, how this book came about, because I'm sure... Uh, some of the people uh, dialing in today and watching this video in the future would like to know a little bit more about how it all came about. Um, well, I, I've been in procurement since about 1868 or something. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> you know, I, I'd love to say that from the beginning of my procurement career, I was deeply interested in environmental and social uh, factors and so on. Um, that would probably be a lie because, frankly, back in the 1980s, we, we didn't think about it that much. Um, but gradually over the years and when I was running Spend Matters in Europe uh, through the noughties, you know, it was clear these, these issues were, were really coming to the fore. Um, and I did quite a lot of work in the public sector uh, prior to that and through the noughties. And, you know, governments were picking up on what they now call social value, but everything really from helping smaller businesses maybe sell more to government uh, more apprenticeships, supporting disabled people. So a lot of agendas were coming into public procurement. And then, then I saw that growing really in the private sector as well. Um, and I was asked to, uh, to write a, a thought leadership paper in 2017, I think, by uh, Ariba, if I can mention, mention Ariba, Samia Kalde. Um, <laughs> sorry, Mark. And um, uh, I was asked to write a pa paper on, on procurement with purpose or procurement with a purpose. And um, it was a really interesting topic and I got more and more into it. And I thought having uh, having by that stage, it's now 2019, 2020, 2019, um, pretty much finished writing Bad Buying. I thought, well, this is the next book. And I was literally just scoping out the book when I got, I can't remember whether it was an email or, or a phone call from a Mr. Mark Pereira, who I'd known for many years saying, hey, Peter, I've got this great idea. I want to really get behind this purposeful procurement agenda. And I think we should do a website and we should we should write a book. And I said to Mark, well, that's funny you should say that. Let me send you the, the summary I wrote about two weeks ago of what I think might make a book. That's absolutely true. It was, uh, what's it, great minds think alike or fools seldom differ. So it just seemed like it was the the zeitgeist or whatever it was the time time to do it um so we we sat down and started planning it out and thought about we wanted to interview lots of interesting people and we didn't want it to be a textbook but we wanted it to have some serious content that would actually help procurement people so not just a lot of you know theoretical background and interviews um but actually get into some practical stuff as well and and two years later here we are yeah, well, I think uh, Pete, I'm sitting on a, a beach in Mallorca pre-COVID, obviously, um, uh, thinking about life and how we could uh, contribute. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it's been a great project with you. So Pete, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the journey with me. But um, I think if we can help, you know, one individual making a difference or uh, one or two companies make a difference as we look at the next 10 years, uh, especially around the climate change, um, it's... it's um, it, it, it's going to make uh, hopefully roll up as more than one person we're, we're hopeful there's a few people take the book take the actions from the book and start living it um 
again, as we say, uh, every five weeks is 1% of the decade. So when we're starting to put these 2030 tar targets around climate change or supplier diversity and uh, all the kind of range of things that come in the ESG, I think um, how to get companies getting started and, and start doing these ones. So uh, it's been fascinating to, to work with you. It's great to get the book out. And um, as I say, um, we've had some great feedback already and I, we've already had a few questions coming from the live chat. So um, thanks, Sarah mm -hmm. and uh, Natia, um, uh, Natalia. Uh, for your questions there. So I'll definitely answer those as we go along. Um, but firstly, we should thank the other people who actually make this book happen, Peter, because uh, we did not do this uh, alone and uh, huge help to, or thank you to them. So maybe you want to yeah. ring through a, a few of the people that we spoke to and helped us on the journey. Yeah, well, it, well, I mean, this list really ranges from, I mean, there's a few people on there where they've helped us in the promotion of it. So we've done podcasts recently people like Tom Raftery, um, who else on there have we done podcasts with? We're going to do one with Phil and Kelly very soon. Uh, Jonathan O'Brien, of course. Sherry. And um, Sherry, Sherry, yes. Um, then there's people we interviewed and published interviews on the Procurement with Purpose website. And then I took chunks from those interviews and sort of dropped them into the book where, where they made sense. Um, and then there were several people where actually the interviews had so much content uh, they've gone in the book as a whole chapter. So we have case studies from um, from Vodafone, Heineken and Unilever. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all of those people. And uh, it was just a great excuse to talk to lots of really interesting people, actually. Um, ra ranging from uh, ex-finalists in Britain's top model through to senior civil servants and all, all sorts of interesting people. So thank you all very much indeed yeah no it's been great uh, speaking and interviewing these uh, different people from from all walks of life uh, on the topic area and the great thing i think that's come through is the passion around the um around the i guess the, the procurement with purpose movement that we're, we're making or we're part of peter um the individuals is how they see you know their roles evolving and how um passionate they are of making a change with their teams as well so um, thank you very much to everyone who's been involved in you know, helping us to create the book t today. But um, I've got to say, things are moving so quickly that uh, we will be thinking about uh, the next edition of the book and also how we keep these uh, conversations going as well. Uh, scaring Peter already talking about the next edition, but it's, it's, things are moving wow. fast as well. I, I, I realised this a few months ago, actually. I think it was when we, we realised that we were going to be looking at publication around the time of COP. 26, which wasn't deliberate. Um, but then, of course, he suddenly realised that, well, that means there's going to be nothing about COP26 in the book, really, because, you know, it was finished before then. Um, and every time I see there's new guidance coming out from, from the government on various issues, there's new technical announcements from people, everything from, you know, circularity to more compostable packaging. So, yeah, I think if if it goes well and if people enjoy it and find it useful um then i i think it's going to need a new edition every 18 months or so to be honest to keep keep it up to date and and i don't mean just i don't know changing a few names and adding the odd paragraph i mean quite quite a major rewrite because a lot of these topics are are moving just so quickly there we go well look peter as we're live on this i'm going to try and some try something i'm going to try and drag this comment this question on here um hopefully you can see that um would this book have been written 10 years ago or is evolved with the topics at the present time i i think it could have been written but it would have been very different as i've just said things are are changing so quickly um so i give you an example talking about people who helped us i actually had the pleasure of uh, interviewing one of my old university friends russell pico and Russell had a very successful career with one of the biggest banks in the world, ended up just below main board level as corporate treasurer and financial control and all this sort of thing. Um, and, and he was sort of, um, I won't say, I wouldn't call him Mr. Capitalist, but you know, he, he was from that banking background. And uh, since he, he retired from that, he's become this huge evangelist for for how big companies in particular report on climate change and what they're doing about it not just reporting um and he gave us some great quotes you know he said 
something along the lines of if we if we allow it capitalism will ruin the world <laughs> which is pretty good coming from someone who was right at the top of one of the biggest companies in the world but he he's now chairman of a huge pension fund and sits on the board of a couple of others and plays a role in making investment decisions around literally trillions of of dollars well many billions anyway um and he's looking at time frames that are that are 50 years or more because he's thinking about the pensioners in those pension funds uh, who will be drawing you know they're, they're young employees now and they'll be drawing pensions in 50 60 70 years time and he's looking at investments with that horizon now i i don't think people like russell existed 10 years ago i don't think business and and the financial world had that perspective and and if you look at a, a totally different topic again something like diversity um you know that that wasn't where it is now by any means so it would have been a very different book 10 years ago i mean it would have been a bit more positive in some ways maybe we wouldn't have chopped down quite as much of the amazon rainforest by then but um yeah it would have been different there we go well, we're going to get into a little bit of our structured conversation but uh, i may as well pick up some of the comments coming through as they they do we've got sasha arthur here asking whether this is uh, right for a younger audience or is it for more for an established leader <laughs> he's at university at the moment uh, I, I think seven and above, is that what they say? No, um, it's, there are sections of it that will make more sense to procurement practitioners, but there are also, um, there's probably two thirds, three quarters of it that really any interested person above the age of, I don't know, 14 would find interesting. A lot of the background to these issues, why they're important, um, as I say, I think any interested teenager, I, I'm the, I'm a school governor. I'm hopefully going to go and talk to the sixth form about about this fairly soon, and I I would expect them to be quite interested. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's you know when you when you get the section about how to actually incorporate these issues into your tender evaluation process, that might not appeal to to every university student, but the, there'll be a lot of the book that I would hope they'd find interesting. There we go. Look, I'm going to turn back to some of these other questions that are coming through, uh, Peter. But maybe say, so the book uh, is officially launched today. Um, I've added some uh, links already into the uh, LinkedIn uh, chat already in the comments. But um, where can people purchase the book? Um, well, it, lots of places, except having just gone to Amazon, it's actually saying temporarily out of stock. So there's obviously been lots of orders in in the first few days um but but it it'll be back in stock hopefully and uh we can reprint reprint if necessary with a couple of weeks notice so do do keep ordering but the best route from our point of view is to use our publishers online bookshop um basically because we get a higher proportion of the revenue than we do if it goes through amazon and you're supporting a small business so brown dog bookshop and i should say that we're doing this on a not-for-profit basis so when i say we get more revenue that means ultimately more revenue going to uh, to charities that we we've chosen um so I, and i'll i'll um yeah I'll, I'll give away the magic code to those those who are listening if you go onto the brown dog bookshop and when you get to the checkout uh, and it asks you whether you have a, a code or whatever the word is uh if you put in PWP in capitals 2021, PWP 2021, you'll get a three pound discount off of every book. So it was worth coming on the session this afternoon for your three pound discount. Sorry if people have already ordered it and didn't get that, but uh, we just set that up with it being published today. So excellent. So it's on. Uh, I prefer that that didn't get broadcast, you know, to everyone in the world on LinkedIn and Twitter, because it'd be quite nice to sell some at full price as well. <laughs> Well, it's good to get the, uh, the the profits from this and put it into good cause as well. But um, also uh, available on Amazon as uh, ebook and Apple uh, as an ebook as well. Um, as a, a lot of people will be um, uh, buying uh, on there, those and, and maybe uh, you know saving a few bits of paper uh, in there. But all the books are on recycled paper as well, because it would be uh, wrong for us to do anything other than uh, that as well. Um, so quickly. Um, we talked a bit about what inspired um, us to do that and uh, and the people contributing, but maybe you could cover the key topic areas that we, we've covered in the book as well, Peter. 
Yeah, so, so there are four sections. The first section really is about the, the background to purposeful business generally. So a little bit of history, and this didn't all start in the last 10 years actually. Um, a bit about the rise of sustainability and purpose as business movements generally and understanding where that's coming from because as that then goes into procurement with purpose and what you can do about it i think understanding those drivers and stakeholders is pretty key um, so relatively short section one section two is sort of the heart of it so that's really what can you do you know how do you develop a strategy for, for procurement with purpose how do you implement it? How do you build it into supply selection, into contracting, collaboration, working with suppliers post-contract, which is absolutely key, as, as Mark and Visible well know. Um, collaboration going beyond individual suppliers, you know, collaborating a, across sectors and industries, and also about a bit about things like um, um, leadership, a chapter about COVID and procurement with purpose, uh, greenwashing. Um, yeah, that's it. It's one of the questions uh, that just came in actually from uh, one of my my team is uh, how do you get corporates acting on purpose rather than talking a good game, Peter? So maybe you could give me a... Come back, come back to that. Come back to that. I'll finish off my sections. <laughs> Section three then looks at eight or nine of the, the big issues. So, you know, climate change, social value, human rights, um, the natural world, plastics, pollution, and so on. So it goes into those topics in more detail, why are they important and, and what are the key issues. And then section four is a sort of reference where I think I've identified about 25 different PWP issues. And there's literally a sort of one page. This is what it's about. This is why it matters. This is why it might be important for you as a company, challenges and issues and so on. So it's a sort of aid memoir almost at the end. So that's the structure of the book. Um, what was that question? How do you how do you make it real? I think it's about the greenwashing from Alex uh, Short uh, on that one. Yeah, I I think the good thing is it, it's the world is getting more savvy, and the media and the consumers and the investors are are getting more savvy. So these things are being picked up faster. I think generally. So I think companies are realizing that they they won't get away with it. Um, and, and I mean, that's probably the answer to, to your question. We all have to be diligent and we have to understand what's going on and challenge corporates if they if they don't do it or they do give us a lot of bullshit. Um, and it was interesting recently when um, Mark Carney, who ran the Bank of England till not very long ago, he's now involved with a big investment fund in, in the States, I think. And they put something out saying how wonderfully green they were and this this fund or this company was you know doing all this great sustainable environmentally sound stuff and and within hours people had pointed out that they were actually also okay they were doing some good stuff but they were also investing in coal mines and oil and gas and, and all this and he took a real hammering um and i noticed the investment company Prince Harry and Meghan are involved with something similar happened recently because they're positioning themselves as sort of super green. Uh, and then it came out that actually, you know, their investment advisors and, and while they, they, they'd advise you, Mark, on how to invest your money in a green manner, basically, if you said, oh, but I really like cigarettes and oil, they're, they're quite happy to advise you on that as well. So, yeah, I think things are changing know, now. It's, uh... Things are changing. People are getting smarter. I think that's what we have to do to hold people to account. Yeah. So um, we've got a few more questions coming through, but um, in terms of, and I'll come back to those questions, but in terms of what people can learn from the book, if you kind of um, gave me three or four bullet points, what would be your, your key, key takeaways? Um, I think in some cases, just a deeper understanding of some of the issues. Um, and I, I mean, social value is an interesting one. It's it's sort of a bit of a public sector catch-all. But some of the early work in social value was well intended, but I think not didn't particularly pay back because it hadn't been thought through properly. So um, I think in some cases, sort of understanding the issues and having the background to work out how to develop a strategy uh, and, and what a good strategy looks like. Um, then I think some of the action points around this is all very well, but how do I build it into my supplier selection processes? 
and and you know how do you build collaborative relationships with suppliers uh i, I mean one of the problems is as i wrote i thought pretty much every chapter of this book could be a whole book in itself and i mean you know jonathan o'brien's written a great book on supplier relationship management and, and i i've got about i've got one chapter on it here um coming at it from the purposeful focus so so you know some of those action points and, and I, we've put in key takeaways uh, to help people and then i think the case the, the case studies are quite inspiring yeah um, i think I, the, the, the i think the key takeaways at the end of every uh, section are, are really valuable as you go through because you can you can put them into to action and, and understand the key, the key takeaways uh, on that side i think it is that nice part of both looking from developing a strategy side but also how you you can go about and put that in there you know you talk about the segmentation and these other ones as well i think there's there's tools and approaches that you can take out of there and apply straight to your organization um you know with, with your peers in there so i think it's a nice balance be, between the two you mentioned about those those case studies um we spoke to a you know a lot of uh great individuals on on there and you know we've we put some of those quotes up and, and talked talked about them a bit but uh, maybe if you could pick out a few actually there's a nice question here um all right i'll let you carry on with the case studies and i'll bring in the questions after that so um okay. a couple of the case studies that i'd like to pull out well i think we we should give a shout out to the uh, the procurement pledge people sustainable yeah. procurement pledge so thomas uderson and and friends and, and now actually oliver hurry who we interviewed is involved as well um so you know some great stuff they've been doing building a community across the procurement world so not not an individual company case study but a, a nice example of of how this is taking off and and getting critical mass i think um in terms of the the companies i mean unilever's fascinating because they are seen as perhaps the leaders in the last decade on on all of this um and i think with unilever one of my takeaways was the combination of setting incredibly ambitious targets for themselves to the point that a couple of their initial targets they they realized probably were unachievable um, but also as they've gone through the last decade understanding that even for unilever you do have to focus you you can't do everything I, and i hope that's a message that comes through because I, I i do talk to people from particularly i suppose smaller companies who find this whole agenda a bit intimidating you know, a small procurement team. How do I do all this? How do I do environment and human rights and orangutans in the jungle? And, and you know, it all looks a bit scary. So I think understanding that even Unilever have had to prioritise and work out where their resources could really make a difference. I think that's a powerful message. Um, Hervé at Heineken was a, a great interview. That was fantastic. That was one of the, uh, well, they're all great, but I love that one with Hervé. <laughs> We, we weren't allowed to print some bits of it because he, he said a bit more than he should probably about Heineken in a good way, <laughs> but some of their future plans. Um, but one of, one of his really interesting points was he said, if you go back a few years, people looked at a lot of the environmental stuff as being just regulatory. You know, we have to do what the regulators or the governments are telling us to. And companies have now realized that they can actually get competitive advantage and better reputation with their customers if if they do the right things environmentally. But he said the social side of it, so that's diversity, human rights, all of those issues, he thinks that's the next level there. So at the moment, we're perhaps still more in a regulatory environment that you, you mustn't break the law on sex discrimination, you mustn't break the law on modern slavery, but how you turn that actually into a positive a positive factor that's going to help your competitive advantage um, and that plays over into the Vodafone case study because because they're definitely doing that you know they're making a big thing of things like diversity in their supply chain uh, and they said a few months ago that all their major tenders at least 10 percent of the the scoring in the evaluation is is going um, to purposeful factors let's say which could be diversity could be related to uh, you know the health and safety of the workforce in their suppliers but they're, they're really paying attention to that so some some good learnings there i think yeah actually there's a white paper um i'm going to continue uh, off the back of this actually uh, peter and myself are, are planning to do a weekly newsletter on procurement with purpose so that will also be coming through through linkedin but um there's a question from uh, 
Annette um, about where we're referencing some of this other material might come from as well. So um, we will continue publishing our, ourselves um, but uh, and also lead you to other people's uh, content because it's all about sharing and collaborating. There was a really interesting um, article white paper from BCG last week, which I published and did a video on, which I think was really interesting about uh, taking a decarbonisation approach with your supply chain. So we'll continue uh, sharing uh, content around procurement with purpose. This doesn't need to be everything that we're writing on the procurement with purpose blog post uh, on the blog, which definitely should read. But um, uh, please do share content with Peter and myself and, and hopefully we can help broadcast um, the, the good material out there through our networks as well. Uh, and also look at it as we go into the the next book as well. But um, yeah, more case studies, Pete. I'm looking forward to to continually talking to people about how they're yeah. applying this uh, in their organisations as as well. Yeah, no, we we need to do definitely need to do that. <laughs> I've got a question here from Sarah, which uh, be a nice one, uh, Peter, for well, for both of us to address. Um, um, some of the anecdotes either you heard in writing the book or that surprised or shocked you in the way that you weren't expecting? Hmm, good, good question. Um, I, I, I think still sometimes, I mean, not from the, the big companies we interviewed, but just, just talking around to people generally and even more recently as, as you know, I've done a few webinars and so on. Um, Still, still quite a lot of people, as I say, struggling with the whole agenda just looks so big and scary. Where do I start? And and quite a lot of procurement people saying, um, I can't remember who, who said this, somebody did say this, that, that even at senior procurement levels, there's sometimes lip service paid to this. So uh, one of Mark's favourite expressions is the buzz from the bottom. So you can say a bit about that in a minute, Mark. But but pe but people saying, well, actually, I do think there's enthusiasm for this at the operational level in procurement. You know, the category managers, and perhaps it's partly the younger people, but a feeling that still quite a lot of CPOs are sort of saying the right thing, but not really putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, I, either, you know, investing in the resources or training or whatever to make this happen, or, or being prepared to do things like kick out suppliers if they're they're not meeting the standards on, on whatever it is or or incorporate these things actually into the selection of, of suppliers and incorporate it into your contracts so um yeah. so you know it's easy to think all the cpos in the world think this is wonderful and are fully behind it but probably not the case yet yeah i think there's some uh, that balance of creating an amazing strategy and, and a lot of these topic areas you need to do some benchmarking on you look at climate and greenhouse gases but actually it's getting on and doing things. So um, that buzz at the bottom uh, phrase came from a conversation with Jim Massey, uh, our head of our advisory board at Visible. Um, and it's all about actually starting collaborating with your suppliers and making the difference. So whether that's uh, working on cross industry um, programs, uh, I think um, Novartis, um, were involved with the Schneider Electric program Energize, um, so helping companies to move to green energy and, and reducing energy programs there that came out in the last couple of weeks, or collaborating with your you know individual suppliers around re reducing and removing uh, carbon within your own uh, value chain. But it's the projects that add up to the value, and I think that's what we're seeing when we we look at CDP reports, carbon disclosure reports, and the climate change. You're reporting on the collaborations and innovations that you're doing with your supplier, because ultimately that's where the change is going to come from. So, um, yeah, let's see how you know you go out and do those things, and hopefully the book helps inspire some of those types of collaborations that you can do, uh, both industry-wise and also with your suppliers as well. I've got another it's, question. It's, sorry. Oh, sorry, just a quick one. I'm 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 talking briefly tomorrow night at a uh, a group that's linked to Oxford University, all about outcomes in public procurement. Uh, it's quite a, quite an academic group, to be fair. Um, but one of the things I'm going to say there is it's a bit of an issue for the public sector because the public sector doesn't tend to do long-term collaboration with suppliers terribly well, partly because they're, they're sort of forced into competing every so often by regulations. Um, so there are some natural barriers. But, but what I'm going to say tomorrow is, you know, this, some of the best examples of what's happening in the private sector are long-term collaboration 
uh, between buyers and suppliers or often across industries across sectors and so on so the public sector has to work out how it can how it can do some more of that i think uh within the constraints of regulations and, and ethics and and everything else yeah there's a um yeah there's a, a white paper that i'll be going through actually on incentivizing um kind of change both with suppliers but internal so i'll i'll do that in the next couple of weeks i think it's a really interesting one um andrea uh, asked the question which was of the four sections of the book peter uh which was the hardest to write uh yeah, that, I think that's quite an easy question, actually. So so the first section, the background is dead easy, could have written more. Second section is is sort of technically procurement -y, so I, you know, I can I can write that relatively easily. Uh, it was the third section where I was writing about the topics and not because it was difficult to write stuff. It was keeping it to a manageable chapter because, you know, I've got one chapter on on what's it called? Plastics. Plastics, pollution and obsolescence. So that includes all the plastic waste issues, um, you know, landfill waste, everything, chemicals uh, and the whole circular economy um, initiative, which, again, I'm, I'm sure people have written whole books about it or they're certainly working on it now, I suspect. So it was it was trying to work out how to write 20 pages or so that was interesting useful would add some value to someone who wanted to know a bit about it and summarize it w without ending up writing a whole book about it so that that was the that was the challenging part of it yeah for any of the listeners if you're into the circular economy then i can very much recommend deborah dull's new book that's come out on circular economy and um yes yeah, she'll, she'll be doing a, i think she's uh, deborah's with us uh, on wednesday actually on our decade of our live session as well oh, and so, so that's, that's out now is it her book yeah, I've got it here. One sec. Let me. Oh wow! Okay, I haven't read that. Well, it's uh, it's live. It's on Amazon. Um, I think on Amazon. So, yeah, circular supply chains. Seventeen common questions. So, I'll look okay. to do a live session with uh, Deborah like this, uh, going through those seventeen different De questions. Deborah, Deborah has the 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 least appropriate name of anyone I've ever met in my life. I think. <laughs> Very not dull. So, uh, um, yeah. So I think that's a. Uh, Interesting, actually, there's, and there's Camilla Pope, who I'd love to interview. Um, she's done a, uh, a PhD in planned obsolescence. So uh, how mm -hmm. companies actually plan the obsolescence into their products, which I'm sure they won't be doing in the future. But, um, yeah, it's a, a big change on, on that side as this well. Is, this is why, why your dishwasher always breaks down one month after the warranty expires. Indeed, and maybe why your phones used to slow down when a new one was coming out as well. But, um, yeah. Um, it seems that we've uh, had some uh, good comments in terms of the, the, the timing of this book um, as well. I think uh, with COP26 uh, coming, uh, just come and gone, uh, I think the timing was there. We did actually get the ebook out for COP26, yeah. but um, I think uh, it was great timing. And there's a, a question here around COP26. Um, again, maybe this is in your, your next or our next edition of the book. I put yeah. all the comments on you could you doing a lot of the uh, well most of the hard right, right word hard work writing peter but um uh, if you were writing uh, this book now right after cop 26 what would you add is there something that came out of cop 26 that uh, would make you change well, a position on this I, I think i'd have to add some bits about the sort of political dimensions of it and um you, you know china and india and australia perhaps not signing up to everything but a but a different approach compared to the previous big cop which I think this time more more focus on getting agreements that a lot of people would sign up to, even if not everybody did, which is sort of positive and negative. So I think some comments on the politics of it all. Um, but also, I'm, I mean, to be honest, I hadn't really looked at methane very much in, in this book. And, and clearly there was a big new agreement on methane that made me go and do a bit of back, a bit more background reading on methane and think, Okay, there's going to be a few pages on methane in, in the next the next book, for instance, um, and then in other cases, you know, the deforestation ag agreement. I don't think that really added much to what I've said in there, which is, as long as you've got people like Bolsonaro in charge in Brazil, we've got problems. I think, but, yeah. um, but it's difficult, isn't it? Because I've also I've mentioned briefly my grandfather, who was a coal miner his whole life up in the northeast, and 
you know, we dug up all our coal and burnt a lot of our forests and, and um, put pollution into the environment and the sea and the land through the 19th and 20th centuries in the UK. And it's quite, and got rich out of it. So it's quite hard for us now to tell India and China and Brazil that you can't exploit your natural resources and, and get rich like we did because it's bad news for us in in the UK. So, so getting into deep philosophical waters there. But, uh, right. uh, yeah, so I think I, uh, I would have added a bit more of that debate, but um, but methane was interesting. I, I had I wasn't on top of the methane debate. Yeah, I've got a few other questions, um, which I think yeah, there's some good questions. I can, I can yeah. see. I think this is the joy of doing the live sessions, Pete, because we get mm. these questions coming in and keep keep you up on our toes. So, uh, capabil uh, capability uplift uh, remains a, a key focus of the profession, um, based on the procurement with pur purpose priority. Um, what do you think is lacking in terms of capability? Well, I I, I think it's it's as I probably said earlier, it's needing to understand the issues and and then how do you translate those issues into strategy and into, into implementation. So, I, I mean, it's a big gap throughout the whole process and uh, uh, I don't know where SIPs are on, on changing their, um, what's the word, not prospectus, what do you, syllabus, syllabus. Uh, it's a problem for SIPs because it takes years to change the syllabus, but you know, these things need to start being being taught um, and and we need more training and we need senior people to take the lead and make sure their own teams are being trained and uh, and understand these issues but it is changing so quickly it is difficult this is not like you know I'm sure the theory of, of negotiation has changed over the years but probably teaching someone negotiation 30 something years ago when I came into the profession wouldn't be too different to how it's done now but but you know, in terms of understanding these issues, it's got to be it's got to be kept up to date constantly. I think. Yeah. So I certainly, think certainly, the bigger companies are appointing specialists within procurement um, to take the lead on this as a subject matter expert, um, so that they can promote that. So I do think it's a responsibility of every category manager to to build this into into their category strategies and approaches. It can't you know it can't be done to them by someone outside that um, but I think you probably do need a subject matter expert who can help the operational people the category managers uh, understand the issues and do the right things here yeah I think it's also for the leadership to create the environment for procurement and sustainability teams to to also make an impact so giving them the time and the um, reward uh, for doing that because a lot of these programs break the uh, the yearly cycle of procurement savings to uh, to, to run over. So we need to look at the portfolio of projects that they're working on, the collaborations with suppliers or industry collaborations that are coming through and making sure there's visibility and reward around those. Otherwise we have the risk of uh, dropping everything in the final quarter to get our savings targets in. So I think we need to balance up the, um, the commercial side or the productivity side, the sustainability, but also growth. Uh, I mean, this is the interesting part. I don't think we can take any of these topics as a as a single focus. Now, climate change and greenhouse gases is going to, obviously going to be a big one, but we also need to see how the company continues running. So the business model needs still needs to be profitable and sustainable. Uh, so we talk about sustainable business growth. So how do we bring these these different topic areas in whilst also keeping the the business um, running? But um, it's been an interesting yeah. balance. I think uh, the other part is things are changing um a lot so you know this we talk about climate we're learning about climate how do we make the the right changes with our suppliers and and selection of suppliers and and trying to get to these targets of 2030 and 2040 in terms of net zero and, and carbon neutrality um but things will change we're going to have the waves of uh, for, deforest, uh, forestry 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 uh, we're going to have fair living wage and all these other things coming in as well. So we're going to have to learn as each one of these um, parts come through. And we can't, as you said at the beginning, we can't try and address all of them at the same time. Can I can I choose a couple of questions and answer them quickly? Sure. If you can see them as well. Okay. I, I can see them, yeah. Right. So someone says, the drive for social value and procurement has often been ethics and doing the right thing. Do we need to move beyond ethical arguments to a risk-based argument? For example, is it now an organisational necessity given the threats to operational resilience? Well done. Um, 
I, I think the answer is yes. I think it, it's definitely that that was a theme that came out from almost everyone we interviewed who's you know doing this in in successful companies. Um, it is doing the right thing, but but that's not the main driver. They're doing it for for good business reasons. Ultimately, um, it's not just risk based. It can be value based. So risk can be a big part of it. I mean, I, I would argue that having a a diverse supply chain in the wider sense of diversity gives you more operational resilience than just buying from the same handful of big companies that everyone else is buying from, for instance. Um, but there's also value. And, you know, Unilever are doing this in part, at least, because their customers are demanding it. And they think if they come out with better, more sustainable products and packaging that's recyclable and compostable and all of that, they're going to sell more. So, so yeah, it's it's moving beyond doing the right thing into into risk and value. I would say, um, yeah, yeah. I think it's a, I think it's also interesting to um, again those topics like diversity. Is it the ownership of the company? Is it the leadership of the company? Or more interesting, I had a conversation, a few of these conversations. Is it if you're with a, a large consultancy that you know is global across the business? Um, and their leadership is now diverse. What about the people who sit across the desk from you? So the client team, if they're all white middle class men um, who actually sit across and work with you, does that really show a diversity in terms of the supplier that you're working with? So I think this is the interesting part on some of these topic areas. It's not going to, you know, ownership or leadership, and maybe the teams that you're working with, because that's the true part of. Uh, the opportunity with working with more kind of diverse mindsets and, and inclusion as well. So not a simple thing to, uh, to address. Um, not sure the other question I, I, I quite fancy just responding to, if that's all right, is, is public sector procurement becoming overloaded with policy objectives? Oh, that's yeah, a good question. That's a good, that's a good question. Very good question. I, I did a lot of consulting for government from about 2003 to 10. Um, and looked at some of these issues and we were going through that even then. Um, so I think the, the obvious answer is yes, it is overloaded. What I would argue for, and this is, I, I, I alluded to this earlier when I said some of the early stuff on social value in the public sector wasn't going in the right direction. Um, Cause it did tend to present suppliers with a shopping list of, you know, here's 150 things you can do and you'll score points for them all. And it was, yeah. Um, so my argument would be that every public and private sector organization has to focus on where it can really make a difference. So, you know, in some cases that might be about local enterprise and localism and supporting employment of disadvantaged people in your locality, disabled people, whatever. Um, in other cases, it may be, if you're the M MOD, it may be more about emissions in your supply chain because you buy huge quantities of metal and steel and God knows what. Um, so, you know, asking MOD, well, I, I mean, the UK government set targets on use of small businesses years ago, which are absolutely ridiculous and cannot be achieved because MOD can never buy from <laughs> small companies to make warships. So, you know, focusing on what you can achieve. And MOD has done good work looking at using more diverse suppliers down the supply chain, second tier and third tier. So don't give them targets for their first tier suppliers because that's ridiculous. If you're a local authority uh, or, or university, you can focus on different things where you can have an effect. So um, I, I don't think we should be asking every public sector body to try and focus on everything is, is the answer. It needs a bit of thought here, I think. A few more questions come in here. Maybe I'll, I'll pick up on this one. Um, how can we include everyone to create uh, systems and integrate tools, uh, you know, bringing spend and specific missions based on products? I think it's a really interesting uh, point there, uh, Samir. Um, we're seeing more technology coming in, in and around this space, but I think it's, um, it's still a bit fragmented uh, in there. Also, how do we make it easier for companies to be good as well? So how does it, you know, how do we help large companies work more collaboratively with their suppliers to reduce carbon? Um, educate people about carbon um, um, the suppliers as well because I think that's that's one of the biggest challenges about uh, some of these programs 
is actually educating the suppliers and working together to to reduce these numbers as well. Um, but bringing through the maturity of the suppliers, looking at the action plans in there against your um, spend is, is part of that. And that's something that we're doing at Visible, but there's some other great technologies out there as well. I know, um, you know, the sourcing suites are all looking at this uh, space as well. Um, so it's worth speaking to the technology providers that are in your company today, but also um, there's a good five or six, um, I think, best of breed solutions that are sitting around that. And uh, I'll try and do a blog post or a video around those and share them with you. Um, kind of break them down into the different uh, areas of how they complement companies who are on a journey as well. But um, yeah, we do need more technology around this. We also need the engagement with suppliers so we can get that buzz on the bottom. I think there's one risk which is too much of just looking at dashboards versus actually doing things as well. So we need to break the uh, the uh, the analytics and just looking at the, the dashboard into how we're actually making the change as well. I, I think there's going to be a, a big problem or set of problems around verification in the next few years, particularly around emissions, but probably in some other areas as well, whether it's human rights, deforestation, um, because, well, you, you know, Mark, scope three emissions in particular, it's going to be a real challenge for companies to, to get to grips with those and, and report them and so on. Um, and, and how on earth we're we going to verify if we're, we're asking all our suppliers, and it, it's a network, isn't it? Everybody is a, a supplier and most people are, uh, are buyers as, as well. Um, but we're all going to be declaring emissions to each other and, and rolling it up into some sort of reporting. And, and how on earth we're we going to verify that data that's coming out, um, I, I think is going to be a real challenge. Because I can see a situation where, you know, the numbers all add up that, hey, UK's at net zero. And, and yet it isn't really, and it'll become obvious it isn't. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, I think we do need to look at the standards. So on climate change in terms of least reporting, then I think CDP is is clearly uh, required um, as you know as a standard and there's where the, what the standards they're doing for measurements and so forth. But I think CDP becomes the, at least a source of truth for the customers that we're talking about for, for that. But we need to get more more suppliers, more organisations disclosing, which means they need some maturity around carbon and, and their own part. And, and the ultimate position we want to get to, Pete, I think on, on carbon as a topic area, is for every invoice, we'd love to know what the, the carbon footprint of those services and products and materials we have. And I guess alongside that, you would want to make sure the fair living wage is there and the diversity of suppliers through through there as well. I'm not sure whether we're going to get to it. But, um, you know, there is a lot more uh, better scoring for companies rather than just having consultants to come in there and look at the heat map of their their own organisation and, and look at the carbon from actually getting that information from their suppliers. But to get more broad um, data from your suppliers is the education piece to disclosure and then to the scoring behind that. And then you're looking at section 12 which is one of my favorite parts of the cdp climate ones around how they're actually collaborating with their suppliers and customers and upstream partners to actually make the change so i think there's layers of this onion that we're going to have to unfold and and i think validating both the narrative and the numbers is going to be a core part of that as well but the more standards we can adopt and support the better no i i agree but you, you know your emissions per invoice is great and i agree but it's it's rubbish in rubbish out isn't it if you if you don't if the the base data that went in to generate that number was made up by a junior person who had a form to fill in and and a pub to get to that night and just put the first number that came into the head then then yeah, yeah the yeah. ultimate number might look convincing but it won't be i'm not saying that will happen but i've seen, i've just seen something coming from from the uk government that's asking suppliers to sort of do plans and self declare stuff but I can't see any mention of how it's going to be verified or checked or, you know, random auditing or whatever you might might want to do. So the cynic, the cynic in me says, uh, well, write a nice report and submit it to cabinet office and you'll be fine. You'll win. You'll be in with a chance of winning the tender. Well, it's interesting. Again, another conversation today. Um, companies were looking to offset. Um, now there is certain quality levels and 
which offsets you can buy, which will actually be approved. So the whole offsetting side, which was part of people's journey to uh, net zero, is uh, all being thrown up a little bit in the air as well now because there's looking at standards around offset and uh, which ones are going to be accepted. So that changes everything as well. But um, I think, as we say, it's constantly um, uh, changing at the moment. So we're going to have to come to an end fairly soon, but I'm just wondering if there are any other questions from the, the audience out there uh, that they'd like Peter and myself to to answer. Uh, and while you're busy on your uh, your keyboards there, um, then maybe we just can reconfirm. Peter, where can people buy this book? Uh, well, Brown Dog would be our preferred. It's on Amazon. Um, I imagine, I haven't checked actually, I'd imagine it's on other major you know, Waterstones and um, people like that websites. The ebook is available on most of the big ebook platforms now, I believe. Somebody did ask whether it, it's going to be on Book Depository. And yes. I don't know, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be, but I'd have to check with our publishers on that. And does Brown Dog ship overseas was the other question I think we had there. Yes, I believe so. I mean, I mean, there'll be, I think, an additional um, shipping charge which might mean, you know, depending how Amazon do it and whether you're on Amazon Prime and so on, it, it may be in some countries it's it's significantly cheaper to do it through Amazon. I, I don't know, but it should be available elsewhere. Uh, I know Brown Dog is shipping a couple of boxes of books to um, to somewhere in the near continent shortly, so they obviously do do, do that. Yeah. Oh, I, I would just say, I mean, it's, it's a long shot, but if anyone is interested in a, a bulk order, so let's say, I don't know, 20 or 30 or more, um, do come to Mark and, and I rather than just, just going online because we can, we can possibly do something special or, or possibly sign them or something of, of that nature. So, so come to us first. I mean, we might end up saying go through Brown Dog. But, uh, and if anyone wants over 100, we could probably do a special print run. <laughs> Yes, uh, we've I've already had a few uh, people coming to uh, about batch orders, Peter. So uh, we'll have to see how we fulfil those. Hopefully, the supply chain problems that we're uh, uh, getting at the moment is not going to affect us. But um, there are books, I believe, on on Amazon at the moment. We're getting another batch over to them as well. Um, I think uh, yeah, we were kind of oversubscribed, which is great news, Peter. Um, that uh, people are buying it uh, pre-ordering. So we'll just have to make sure that uh, we've got plenty yeah. of uh, books coming through to Amazon and through to our publishers and, and the others. Um, obviously, it is on Kindle and on ebook, uh, on the Apple eBooks as well. So um, it can be purchased on there as, as well. And uh, I guess that's the, the quickest supply chain to get it uh, into your hands. Well, um, it, it, it's interesting. As you're talking supply chain, people might be interested because I, I'm, I've learned a bit about the book supply chain in the last year or so. And um, when I got my first statement from Penguin on the sales of bad buying, I was really pleased, you know, it looked really good. Uh, and then three months later, I got another statement that had a lower number than the, the one I'd got three months earlier. And, and uh, when I got them to explain it, it said, oh, yeah, so Amazon do order physical copies. Um, and, and I think pay for them, actually. I, and based on the early sales, but then quite often, a few months later, the publisher gets a huge batch back from Amazon with with a bill, you know, because they haven't sold as quickly as they thought they would. So it's quite it's quite depressing for an author because it's like you know I've sold X thousand and then six months later I sold X minus two thousand or something. Oh, look, I'm sure that uh, the demand for this one, I think the the timing's right. Uh, a few of the people in the comments there have said I think procurement with purpose is definitely going to dominate the uh, this next decade uh, to 2030, and I'm sure that will run into 2040. Um, I think it's a big change for procurement, and I think um, it's procurement times to to transform. I think this is the biggest change I've seen in my near 20 years of, of focusing on procurement. Um, we've tried to see that shift from, from savings to, to other topic areas, Obviously, we've gone beyond savings to some degree, degree, but this is the biggest shift I've seen. And uh, I'll be stand corrected, but I think this is where procurement truly will go onto the board of organisations, as we know that you know in scope with scope three or greenhouse gases, up to eighty percent of a, a company's uh, greenhouse gases coming from their suppliers. 
we then look at the diversity side, we look at the um, fair living wage, all these topic areas are going to be coming to organisations. And I think, look, if ESG is the change for companies for good, um, and it's uh, it's coming from from their side, from from that kind of more compliant side, and and the investors uh, in terms of being a good company, I'm I'm more than happy. But I think this is procurement's time to now really bring the ESG um, topic area to to organisations and help them. It's going to be um, it's great to see how it is. And every day I speak to um, probably three or four. Uh, CPOs or heads of supply chain and, and their peers in sustainability uh, and it's just uh, growing with so much momentum so I'm looking forward to seeing how the book resonates uh, I would ask you to share your comments on LinkedIn send us messages directly because we'd love to know what you think of the book where we can improve it as well because we will do an next edition uh, on that as well and if you can put reviews on on Amazon particularly if you bought it from Amazon because they get priority but even if you bought it elsewhere a quick review on on Amazon and or Google or wherever you can review would be absolutely great. Assuming it's a reasonably decent review, of course. <laughs> if, if you hate it, just keep it to yourself. I think all good, all feedback's good feedback. It's uh, constructive, Peter. But um, I say that the the book is not the end of this uh, this movement. Um, we will have the uh, weekly newsletter. Uh, we'll be doing more interviews um, like this with with other people, and I think doing them live is a lot more fun. Um, Peter, hopefully you, you've enjoyed the messages coming in on the fly today, and then just recording a session. So we'll give you a bit more pre warning than we did today. Uh, we know the technology um, now works as well. Um, let us know uh, if there's different formats. Um, we can bring on guests on here, and we can have panel sessions. Uh, but we'll try and get a regular cadence of doing uh, these live feeds on Procurement with Purpose. And uh, I have some plans to do a podcast as well. So we will let you know if you follow us on LinkedIn or follow through the Procurement with Purpose hashtag, you'll find us as well. And obviously on the blog. And I think, Peter, uh, we're coming up to five o'clock. We should say once again, thank you to everyone who contributed and helped us with the book. Um, they've gone above and beyond. You've already finished your champagne. I'll, I'll continue with my tea. But thank you very much. Um, we will be getting the books out, the signed copies out to all those individuals who've helped us on the journey. Um, we thank you for all being part of the virtual book launch today. And we look yeah. forward to getting your feedback and uh, and talking to you soon. And we will do a physical uh, book launch uh, when next year when things hopefully all settle down maybe in the spring and uh, and maybe get some guest speakers and do something in, in London so um, I I hope uh, we'll see you there and with that Peter look after yourself uh, I'll catch up with you soon and uh, we'll open another nice bottle of red and uh, and celebrate uh, the, uh, the book going out very soon but um, thanks everyone look after yourselves and have a good uh, afternoon morning and day Cheers.